Monster Hunter World Iceborne's endgame can be a challenge for the best of hunters out there, but with the right weapon and builds, even endgame tasks can easily be achieved. I'm Darkblade, and we're back with even more amazing builds for Monster Hunter World Iceborne. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at endgame builds I use for the Great Sword. The Great Sword is probably one of the hardest hitting weapons in the game, but whilst it hits incredibly hard, it's also very slow. As a result, hunters need to read monsters and strike when the opportunity is right. Do this and you can easily crush any monster. The great sword builds I use tend to focus on DPS more than anything else, but at the same time each of these brings a certain new aspect through various set bonuses and quality of life skills. Now a disclaimer for this series though, these builds are aimed for end game hunters who have completed the main story and have access to pretty much all the weapons and armour the game has to offer. A large jewel collection is also desired but you can always swap out jewels here and there if you do not have what is shown in the video. So the first build I use is the general purpose greatsword build. This greatsword build is a build that I use when I'm casually farming monsters. It has high DPS potential, quality of life skills, can be used against any monster and comes with the bonus of not using up your valuable consumables. So for this build you'll need the Rex Royal Helm Beta, the Rex Royal Mel Beta, Rex Royal Braces Beta, Damascus Coil Beta and the Garuga Greaves Beta. I've also got a Handicraft Charm 4 and for my weapon I'm using the Immovable Dahama which is the Shara Ishvada Greatsword that has an Infinity Increase Augmentation, Health Regen Augmentation and then an Augmentation of your choice to which I've gone for a Defense Increase Augmentation. And then of course when it comes to the mantles, these are down to personal preference, to which I've gone for a glider mantle and temporal mantle. Now as for your jewels, you've got a little bit to play around with here. Firstly I've gone for tenderizer jewels to max out the weakness exploit skill, then gone for an attack jewel to max out the attack boost skill, an elementalist jewel to provide us that non-elemental boost skill, a handicraft jewel to max out the handicraft skill, I've then gone for medicine jewels to increase the recovery up skill, protection jewels to provide us the divine blessing skill, a charger jewel to max out the focus skill and finally sated jewels to give us a maxed out free meal skill. As for the jewels on the mantles, again these are down to personal preference to which I've gone for expert jewels to provide us some critical eye and a flight jewel when we're using the glider mantle to provide us the airborne skill. So if you've done what I've done here you should have a build with 150 health, 100 stamina which will be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt and taking all your relevant consumables. You'll have an attack of 1584 with purple sharpness. You'll have 25% affinity which can be 75% affinity when you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized through clutch claw attacks first. You'll have no element and you'll have a very high defense of 979 that is strong against fire but weak to the other elements. As for the skills, you have attack boost level 7, attack boost increases the raw attack of this build and at level 4 or above it also brings you an extra bonus 5% affinity. You have handicraft level 5 increasing the sharpness of whatever weapon we're using and with this build you need handicraft so you can get to purple sharpness. You have health boost level 3 increasing our maximum health to that potential 200. You have recovery up level 3, recovery up increases how much we heal through healing methods and techniques so when we take a potion it will actually heal us more than if we didn't have recovery up and this also applies to our health regen augmentation. You have weakness exploit level 3 increasing our affinity when we're attacking monster weak points and should these weak points be tenderized first through clutch claw attacks this bonus affinity is increased even further to a potential maximum of 50% at level 3. You have focus level 3 which increases how quickly you can charge up certain moves or certain gauges and with the great sword it basically increases how quickly we can perform charged attacks. You have free mill level 3 giving us a 75% chance of not consuming a potion or other item when we actually use it. So it's a great way of saving on your mega demon drugs and your mega armor skin potions and so on and so forth. Anyway, you'll also have Divine Blessing level 3. Divine Blessing is a wonderful skill that gives us a chance of receiving reduced damage when we take a hit by a monster. You have Critical Eye level 2, which can be potentially level 5, which boosts our raw affinity. You have Non-Elemental Boost level 1, increasing the raw attack of our weapon, so long as it doesn't have an element or its element or element is hidden, as is the case with the Shara Ishvalda Greatsword. You have Coalescence level 1. Coalescence is a decent skill that when you remove a Blight or other ailment from your Hunter, you'll get a bonus increased raw attack, elemental damage and ailment damage. And then finally when you're wearing the mantles, you have Airborne level 1. Airborne basically increases the damage of our airborne attacks. Finally for the set bonus, you have the Tigrex Essence free mill secret, which allows us to get the free mill skill up from level 1 to a potential level 3. 
So there you have it. As you can see, it is a pretty general build, not specialising in any one area per se, but it means it's a build that could be used against pretty much any monster. It does have quality of life skills, damaging skills, and if you're low on rarer potions and other consumables, this build is one to consider if you want to save those more precious items. But every build has its pros and cons. I would say the biggest pro for this build is this an all-round build that can be used against pretty much any monster. On top of that, it's a build that also comes with quite a few quality of life skills, including health boost, recovery up, divine blessing, and so on. And it's also a wonderful build to use if you're low on certain rare items, like I just mentioned. This is all thanks to the free meal skill at level 3. But unfortunately, every build does have its cons. The main cons for this build is unfortunately it is lower on the affinity scale, so it can't really make use of skills like critical boost and that. And unfortunately, it is also a build that has quite a few rarer jewels attached to it. But nonetheless, this is a decent build to use if you're just casually hunting monsters while at the same time saving on your various items and that. But that brings us on to our next build, which is the Earplugs Greatsword build. This build is a personal favourite of mine, which is more of a utility and survival orientated greatsword build than a DPS one. Although it still has decent DPS options, I mean to be honest every greatsword build normally has decent DPS output, it nonetheless comes with skills and options that should make hunts go a little bit more smoothly. So for this build hunters will need their Fell Shroud Helm Beta, the Damascus Mail Beta, the Fell Shroud Braces Beta, Damascus Coil Beta and the Garuga Greaves Beta. I'm also using an Earplugs Charm 4 and for my weapon I'm using the Wyvern Impact Silver which is the upgraded Wyvern's Ignition Greatsword, found from the event quests Every Hunter's Dream and Every Hunter's Dream 3. This has an affinity increase augmentation, health regen augmentation, and then an augmentation of your choice, to which I've gone for a defense increase augmentation. As for the mantles, these are done to personal preference, to which I've gone for glider and vitality mantles. So, as for the jewels, we have a ton of jewels to play around with with this build, so if you don't have what is shown in this video, you should be able to replace them with something else and come out with a fairly similar build. So, for this build I've gone for tenderizer jewels to max out the weakness exploit skill, I've then gone for handicraft jewels to increase the sharpness of this build, a flight jewel for the airborne skill, some recovery jewels for the recovery speed skill, medicine jewels for the recovery up skill, Vitality Jewels for the Health Boost skill, an Elementalist Jewel for the Non-Elemental Boost skill, an Earplug Jewel to max out the Earplug skills, a Flawless Jewel to max out Peak Performance, and Expert Jewels to give us some critical eye. As for the Jewels on the Mantles, these are down to personal preference, to which I've gone for Destroyer and Protection Jewels to provide us the Part Breaker skill and some Divine Blessing. So if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 100 stamina, which will be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt and taking all your relevant consumables. You have an attack of 1,435 with purple sharpness. You have 20% affinity, which will be 70% affinity when you're on a hunt and you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized through clutch claw attacks first. You have no element and you'll have a strong defense of 924 that is strong against fire, water and thunder, neutral against ice, but unfortunately weak to dragon. As for the skills, you have earplugs level 5. Earplugs is a decent quality of life skill that allows you to ignore all monster rules. And while some players may argue that you don't really need earplugs on the greatsword as you can shoulder charge through monster rules, having earplugs at level 5 just allows you to not have to worry about that and instead focus on dealing damage as it allows you to ignore all monster rules, leaving a monster open for your attacks. Or if you're on the defense, it allows you to retreat and recover some health. Anyway, your critical eye level 5. Health boost level 3, recovery up level 3, recovery speed level 3, which increases how quickly the red portion of our health bar regenerates itself over time. And this does combine with the set bonus which we'll talk about in a moment. Anyway, you have weakness exploit level 3, focus level 3, handicraft level 3. You do need some handicraft on this build unfortunately if you want the wyvern impact silver to get to purple sharpness. You have peak performance level 3, peak performance is a skill that increases our raw attack so long as we have full health. And with the set bonuses we are using on this build, we should have full health for the majority of a hunt with this build. Anyway, you have Airborne level 1, Divine Blessing level 1, which can be potentially level 3. You have Non-Elemental Boost level 1, and potentially Part Breaker at level 2 when we're wearing mantles. Part Breaker makes it easier for a hunter to break monster body parts. But anyway, you'll also have the set bonus Val Solvain Super Recovery, which is the Black Veil Valhazak set bonus. 
allowing our health to regenerate naturally over time past the red portion of health. So it basically allows us to regenerate our entire health bar over time. And this coupled with the recovery speed and recovery up means that the rate at which it recovers itself is quite fast. And also if you combine this with the health regen augmentation, it means that we should easily be able to restore our health with this build and thus also keep peak performance active without having to sheave our weapon and drink a potion manually. But there you have it, as you can see again it is a little bit of an all round build in all honesty but it does lean more towards the defensive thanks to having earplugs as well as that strong health regen aspect. But every build does have its pros and cons unfortunately. The biggest pros for this build is again as I already mentioned, it's an all-round build. It can be used against any monster, regardless of their elemental or element weaknesses, thanks to the non-elemental boost skill. It has quality of life skills, health regen, defensive options, the lot. Which brings us on to the second pro, which is its health regen potential. Being able to regenerate your health thanks to the super recovery, recovery speed, recovery up, and health regen augmentation. It means that you can continue a hunt without having to interrupt your assault and drink a potion manually. This also means that peak performance should be active for quite some time during a hunt, giving you increased DPS potential. And then finally, the last pro for this build is, of course, it comes with earplugs. Now, I may be a little bit biased when it comes to earplugs, but it's a wonderful skill that gives you moments during a hunt where you're free to attack a monster or wind up your harder hitting moves or retreat to recover health and such. But unfortunately, every build has cons. The main cons for this build is unfortunately it does lack a little bit when it comes to offensive skills. Whilst yes it does have peak performance, non-elemental boost, weakness exploit and critical eye, it could have potentially made use of more offensive skills. Which of course is an option if you wanted to drop some of the more survival orientated skills or quality of life skills you could add more offensive ones like agitator or attack boost to increase the damage of this build even further. And again when it comes to the cons unfortunately again this is a jewel heavy build and whilst it may not have the rarest jewels out there it still requires a lot of jewels to craft this build. But regardless like I said this is one of my personal favourite builds for me it's a very comfortable build to use as unless you're being careless there is low risk of fainting with this build and it's still able to dish out a decent amount of damage even if it isn't the highest. Which brings us on to the next build which is the Frostcraft Greatsword build. This build makes use of the unique Frostcraft set bonus found on the Velkana set, giving us an extra gauge which is found underneath our stamina bar, which ultimately powers up a build, which at the same time changes its playstyle slightly. So for this build you'll need the Rhymeguard Helm Beta, the Rhymeguard Mel Beta, the Rhymeguard Van Braces Beta, Rhymeguard Coil Beta, and the Garuga Greaves Beta. I'm also using the Handicraft Charm 4, and for my weapon I'm using the Great Demon Rod, which is the Rajang Greatsword. This has an affinity increase augmentation attached to it to counter that negative affinity. As for the mantles, as always, they're down to personal preference, to which I've gone for a glider and temporal mantle. As for the jewels, you'll have a few to play around with here, to which I've gone for tenderizer jewels to max out the weakness exploit skill, critical jewels to give us that critical boost skill, charger jewels to give us some points in the focus skill, vitality jewels to max out the health boost skill, a sheave jewel to max out the quick sheave skill, protection jewels to max out the divine blessing skill, maintenance jewels to give us some tool specialist, and expert jewels to give us a bit of critical eye. As for the jewels on the mantles, I've gone for expert jewels, a flight jewel, charger jewel, and maintenance jewel. So, if you've done what I've done here, you should have built with 150 health, 100 stamina, which will be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt and taking all your relevant consumables. You have an attack of 1560 with white sharpness. You have an affinity rating of 35%, which can be 85% when you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized through clutch claw attacks first. You have a thunder elemental rating of 180, although you don't really have to take this into account with this build, as it has an incredibly high raw attack already. And you have an okay defense of 897, that is strong against ice and water, but unfortunately weak to the other elements. As for the skills, you have critical eye level 6, which can be potentially level 7 when we're wearing our mantles. You have handicraft level 4, unfortunately you do need handicraft on this build to get the Rajan Greatsword to white sharpness. You have health boost level 3, critical boost level 3. Critical boost is a decent skill to use with high affinity builds. Basically every time we crit a monster, you'll deal increased damage, but this only applies to the raw portion of an attack. It won't increase anything to do with the elemental or element portion of an attack. 
Anyway, you have weakness exploit level three, quick sheath level three, which allows us to sheath the great sword more quickly. You have divine blessing level three. You have focus level two, which can be potentially level three. You have flinch three level two, which prevents minor knockbacks. You have tool specialist level one, which can be potentially level two when we're wearing our mantles, and also airborne level one when we're wearing our mantles. And finally, you'll have the set bonus Velkana Divinity. At two set bonus, you have critical element, increasing the elemental damage when we crit a monster. So think of it like critical boost, but for the elemental portion of our attack. And you'll have the main reason for this build when we're in the four piece set, Frostcraft. Frostcraft is a unique skill found on the Velkana armor set, which whilst your weapon is sheathed, an aura of frost will build up around your weapon, indicated in the gauge underneath your stamina bar. Now with Frostcraft, when your weapon is sheathed, the bar will fill up and there are certain points on this bar to which as the bar fills up, as it passes these points, it will increase your attack. However, after you unsheathe your weapon and start attacking a monster, with each hit it will drain this gauge until you sheathe your weapon and allow it to replenish over time. So there you have it. As you can see, it is a strong DPS build that uses the Frostcraft skill. And as a result, it means that you may have to change your playstyle slightly. You will have to sheave your weapon a lot with this build to be most effective with it, but considering with the Greatsword, your strongest attacks only require a few hits, it means that you can really make use of the Frostcraft skill. For example, the main rotation I tend to do with this build is to perform the charge draw attack, then you go into your slinger burst, and then you go into that true charge slash. Doing this means that the true charge slash, which is your hardest hit to move with the Greatsword, should benefit from the Frostcraft effect quite efficiently. But that's the ideal situation. Drawing a hunt, it may not always work out like that, but so long as you're sheathing your weapon quite often, you should be able to make use of that bonus attack that Frostcraft provides. But of course, every build has its pros and cons. The biggest pro for this build, of course, is its ability to use the Frostcraft set bonus, which ultimately links to our next pro, which is it's a high DPS build. Which brings us on to our final pro, which is, despite being a thunder weapon, it can be pretty much used against any monster. The thunder rating for this build is so low, and the raw attack so high, it means that even if a monster is slightly resistant to thunder, you should still be able to use this build against them. Of course, if they are weak to thunder, then this build would be even better. But of course, every build has its pros and cons. The two biggest cons that I would say this build has is its lack of skills that increase the build's raw attack, such as attack boost, agitator, so on and so forth. But this is kind of countered thanks to Frostcraft, which brings us on to the final con, which unfortunately this build does require a little bit of micromanagement when it comes to the actual Frostcraft gauge. If you're not used to sheathing your weapon, it may take a little bit of time to get used to this build's playstyle. But once you've mastered it, this build is incredibly fun to use, and again, it is one of my favorites. Which brings us on to the next build, which is the true critical element greatsword build. Now, hear me out here, because elemental builds with the greatsword have not always been the greatest, but I wanted to demonstrate a build that used an elemental weapon, and on top of that, I wanted to make a build around this specific weapon shown in this video. So, for this build, you need the golden headdress beta, the silver soul mail beta, the silver soul braces beta, silver soul coil beta, and the silver soul greaves beta. I'm also using a frost charm 5, as we're using a frost weapon. And for my weapon, I'm using Xiphius Gladius, which is the um, frozen kingfish greatsword. This is the main reason we're using an elemental build. This weapon is found from the event quest trophy fishing and is a very unique and goofy looking weapon. So, I've added elemental up augmentations to it, affinity increase augmentations, and then a health regen augmentation. As for the mantles, these are down to personal preference. So as for the jewels, you've got a few to play around with here, to which I've gone for charger jewels to max out the focus skill, vitality jewels for the health boost skill, expert jewels for some critical eye, tenderizer jewels to max out the weakness exploit skill, a frost jewel to max out the frost skill, and finally a flight jewel to give us the airborne skill. As for the jewels and the mantles, these are down the personal preference to which I've added protection jewels for some divine blessing and challenger jewels to give us a little bit of the agitated skill. So if you've done what I've done here, you should have a build with 150 health, 100 stamina, which will be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt and taking all your relevant consumables. You have an attack of 1224 with white sharpness. You have 50% base affinity, which can easily be 100% when you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized through clutch claw attacks first. You have an elemental ice rating of 1010 with a strong defense of 941 that is strong against fire and dragon but unfortunately weak to the other elements. As for the skills, your critical eye level 7, you have ice attack level 6, ice attack increases the ice 
rating and damage of whatever build we are using. You are slinging a capacity level 5, this is a byproduct of the gear we're wearing, but increases the amount of slinging ammunition you can have. You have health boost level 3, critical boost level 3, remember critical boost does nothing for the elemental portion, it will only increase the raw attack portion of our attacks. You have weakness exploit level 3, focus level 3, windproof level 1, this is a byproduct of the gear we're wearing, windproof helps resist minor wind attacks. You have airborne level 1, and when we're wearing our mantles you have agitator level 3. Agitator is a skill that kicks in when a monster becomes enraged, increasing our raw attack as well as affinity, and you'll have divine blessing at a potential level 2. As for the set bonus, you have the Silver Raphalos Essence. When you're wearing two pieces of the armor set, you'll have the Slinger Ammo Secret, increasing the Slinger Capacity skill from level 3 to that maximum of level 5. And more importantly, when you're wearing four pieces of the armor, you have True Critical Element, which increases the elemental portion of our attacks when we crit a monster. And this is even more than just the base critical element that we saw on the previous build. So there you have it, as you can see it is a pretty straightforward elemental build and whilst the greatsword may not be the greatest weapon when it comes to making use of elemental or element weapons, it's nonetheless still quite strong. Like I said I wanted to make a build around this very unique greatsword and this is the best I could come up with. But of course every build has its pros and cons. The biggest pros for this build is its high elemental damage. As long as you're taking into account a monster's elemental weaknesses, you should be able to bring them down quite quickly, so long as they're weak to whatever element you are using. Which brings us on to the other pro, which is that technically you could swap out the Frozen Kingfish Greatsword for a weapon of a different element. But this means you'll have to swap out the charm and that single frost jewel to match whatever element you are using. But it can be easily customised. And then finally, for the pros, this build is a very high affinity build, having maxed out critical eye, as well as weakness exploit, critical boost and true critical element, this all adds to the build's overall high DPS. But every build has cons. The main cons for this build is it only really works with weapons that don't need handicraft. If you're using a greatsword that does need handicraft, you're going to have to sacrifice jewels here and there, which can potentially lead to a drop in DPS. And the other con for this build is unfortunately it is sort of lacking when it comes to quality of life skills. But regardless, like I said, so long as you're taking into account a monster's elemental weaknesses, this build can rip through them quite quickly, despite the greatsword not being the greatest weapon when it comes to elemental damage. Which brings us on to our fifth and final build, which is the True Gaia's Veil, Guiding Lands build. This build makes use of the Shara Isvalda set bonus, which means that we do have to take into account what mantles we are bringing into a hunt. But as a result, it is an incredibly tough all-round build, providing us with damage options, survival options, and quality of life options. It also provides us the basic Guiding Land skills we need to farm the monsters found in the Guiding Lands. So for this build, you'll need the entire Shara Ishvalda set, which includes the Shara Ishvalda Helm Beta, Mel Beta, Braces Beta, Coil Beta, and Grease Beta. I'm also using a Master Charm 4, and for my weapon, I'm using the Ruinous Atrocity, which is the Ruiner Nogagante Greatsword. This has an Affinity Increase Augmentation, Health Regen Augmentation, and then an Augmentation of your choice, to which I've gone for a Defense Increase Augmentation. As for the Mantles, this time, they are not really down to personal preference, you need to use the glider mantle and one of the various elemental mantles, such as the fireproof mantle, iceproof mantle, so on and so forth. This is because we need mantles that have a quick cooldown and longer uptime. But we'll talk about that more in a minute. As for the jewels, you've got a few to play around with here, to which I've gone for tenderizer jewels for that weakness exploit skill, charger jewels for the focus skill, protection jewels for divine blessing, expert jewels for some critical eye, a critical jewel for the crit boost skill, a vitality jewel to max out the health boost skill and then I've started working on the guiding lands related jewels including a geology jewel for the geologist skill, fortitude jewel for the fortify skill and then when it comes to our mantles these jewels are important we need destroyer jewels to max out the part breaker skill and maintenance jewel for a few points in the tool specialist skill so if you've done what I've done here you should have a build with 150 health 100 stamina which will be 200 health and 150 stamina when you're on a hunt taking all your relevant consumables you have an attack of 1416 with white sharpness. You have 50% base affinity, which can be 100% affinity when you're attacking monster weak points that have been tenderized through clutch claw attacks first. You have a dragon rating of 240 with high elder sill. And as for your defense, you have an incredibly high defense of 951 that is strong against water, neutral against fire and dragon, but unfortunately weak to water and ice. But as for the skills, you have critical eye level 7. 
health boost level 3, critical boost level 3, weakness exploit level 3, focus level 3, divine blessing level 3, recovery up level 2, a byproduct of the gear. It would have been nice to get this higher, but recovery up at level 2 is still useful. You have coalescence level 2, defense boost at level 1. This is a byproduct of the armor we're wearing. Defense boost basically increases the defense rating of a build. You have Part Breaker level 1, which should be level 3 pretty much the majority of the hunt when we're wearing our mantles. And when it comes to the Guiding Lands, Part Breaker is an essential skill as it allows us to break off monster materials more easily. You have Fortify level 1, increasing our attack and defense every time we faint up to a maximum of 2 times. You have Geologist level 1, which when used in the Guiding Lands allows us to loot monster materials twice instead of once, at least from the high tier monsters. As I said, with this season of builds, Geologist, I'm not sure if this is a bug or what, but currently at the time of this video, it is still working. You have Tool Specialist level 2 when we're wearing our Glider Mantle, reducing the cooldown of our Specialist tools. And finally, you'll have the set bonus Shara Ishvald of Divinity, True Guy's Veil. True Guy's Veil is a buff that kicks in whenever we're wearing a Mantle. Thus the reason we want Mantles on for pretty much the majority of the hunt. When True Guy's Veil is activated, we'll have Tremor Resistance level 3, preventing reactions from tremor attacks. You'll have earplugs level 5, ignoring all monster rules. Maximum windproof, preventing reactions from wind attacks. And a maximum flinch free, preventing all knockbacks and damage reaction from small attacks. So obviously you get all of these quality of life skills on top of the skills that the actual mantles provide. So there you have it. As you can see, it is a strong build and a little bit of an all-rounder build. It can be pretty much used against any monster, despite the weapon we're using being a dragon weapon. This is because Ruinous Atrocity has a high raw attack, so you can pretty much use it against any monster. Of course, if a monster is weak to dragon, this build is going to deal even more damage. But the main aspect of this build you need to get used to is rotating your mantles. So when you start a hunt, you instantly put on the glider mantle, for example. When that runs out, you put on the next mantle, so your elemental one. And by the time that's about to run out, the glider mantle should be off cooldown again which you swap and then you just simply rinse and repeat. So long as you're using the glider mantle combined with one of the elemental mantles, True Guy's Veil should be constantly in effect when you're fighting a monster. But of course every build has its pros and cons. For me the biggest pro about this build is it's an all round build. It does have DPS options, quality of life options and it's overall quite strong. Whilst it doesn't have many skills that increase our raw attack, it is strong when it comes to affinity. Which brings us on to the second pro which is the True Guy's Veil buff itself. When wearing our mantles, we obviously get the bonus of the mantles, but we also get all those quality of life skills added to the quality of life skills the build already has built into it, making for very comfortable hunts. Also a side point I should mention here is, when you are taking on the monsters in the Guided Lands, you can always swap out the elemental mantle to match and counter the element of whatever monster you're hunting, which can ultimately add to this build's survivability and counter some of the elements this build is weak to. And finally for the pros for this build is it's a build that is perfect for the Guided Lands, thanks to utilising all the important Guided Land skills such as Part Breaker, Fortify and Geologist. But unfortunately every build has its cons. The main and biggest con for this build is unfortunately its reliance on mantles and these have to be the upgraded mantles. But as these are endgame builds I'm assuming you have upgraded the majority of your mantles by now so it shouldn't be too much of an issue. But regardless this is a fun build that I like to use in the Guiding Lands and can be used against pretty much any monster. So there we have it, those are endgame builds that I like to use for the Great Sword in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Now of course there are more endgame builds to come, and as I always say, you don't have to use what is shown in these videos, as most tasks in Monster Hunter World Iceborne can be taken on with any weapon or gear set. But anyway, I hope you found this video helpful or informative, and until next time, I've been Darblay, bringing you endgame builds for the Great Sword in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. Hope you enjoyed the video, thanks for watching, subscribe and like for more.